go. And ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to an extended Louis B. Free radio show, Brain Food from the Heartland, because I am so honored to have returning to the show, Jane Harris. You've heard me talking about Jane and Jimmy Edmonds' book, Jane Harris and Jimmy Edmonds' book, When Words Are Not Enough, Creative Responses to Grief. By the way, with a forward by our friend, Dr. Catherine Mannix. Got to, got to get that. In. Jane, welcome back. I'm, I'm honored that you come back and to do the game. Louis, it's so great to be here and to talk to you again. It will, it's a couple of years since we spoke. And in that time, we've, well, maybe, yeah, a year to two years. <laughs> and during that time, we've, we've been writing this book. Um, and so a little bit of background is that I'm a therapist and I'm a filmmaker and I'm also a brave parent. And when I spoke to you last time, we talked about the film that we'd made called A Love That Never Dies, which was all about our road trip across America, interviewing bereaved parents and siblings about grief. What is grief? Can you survive it? Does it change with time? Um, and that film is now available on Amazon and worldwide. And that's amazing because it was a very low budget film with very high kind of production values. Jimmy did the camera work and the editing. I did the interviewing. And as Jimmy, my husband, is a film editor and I'm a therapist, it makes for a good mix because we both have this huge curiosity about people and about life. So when in 2011, we were thrown into this new world when our son died, Joshua, our lovely son, died in 2011, age 22. We kind of thought we didn't know what to do. And when we thought about it really hard, we thought we're going to have to do what we've always done. Otherwise, we're going to get lost in space. We're going to get lost full stop. And so we kind of, it dawned on us, we were going to have to carry on making films, which is what we do. We met at film school way back quite a few decades ago. We're not as young as we were. And we were going to have sorry, to Jane. carry on writing. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. But look, at, again, uh, can we talk more about Joshua? A yes, bit? of course. So, so Joshua was 22 when he died. He was a lovely young man in a very happy place. And he'd found the job of a lifetime, his dream job, working as a young producer at the Ministry of Sound in London, which for him was his dream. And everything had kind of come together. And like most parents, I kind of thought, relax, this is it. You know, he's found his place, I've done my job. It's roots and wings. Um, and at that point, he decided he was gonna go on the trip of a lifetime. He decided he was gonna do a bit of traveling and then come back and carry on with his job. And so he went to Vietnam, he did a huge tour of Southeast Asia, and while he was there, his life was lost. He was in a car accident, he was in a, he was in a road traffic accident um, where someone stepped out in front of him and he swerved to avoid them and he kind of died instantly, which, you know, 11 years now since that happened, and it still is jarring. How can it not be a death in the wrong order of things? But I can say, I miss him as much as I ever did, but you never stop loving your child or a loved person when they go. But the point is that with time and hard work, you kind of fold them into your heart and you learn how to carry them with you. And I suppose that's what me and Jimmy have done. You know, we, we all grieve differently, Louis, don't we? We all take yeah. a different approach to grief. And for Jimmy, he wanted to write, he got into cold water swimming, then we made a film. Then we started a charity, the Good Grief Project, which was our way of supporting other bereaved people. And this charity, the Good Grief Project, was based on the idea of continuing bonds, creating a safe space for people to come away for a weekend. We would fund it through our charity. We would provide a creative environment in a beautiful place. People could come regardless of their incomes. That's what our charity does. We raise money to support people. And we offered writing workshops, physical boxing exercise, good food, 
um, photography. And our thinking was that if we could create a safe space where people could take their masks off, very timely, I know post COVID, but people could take their masks off and be themselves, then that could be one way of helping people rediscover a kind of meaning and focus again in their lives when all seemed lost. And so that's what we've been doing over the last few years. Uh, as I say, it's 11 years since Josh died, but since we started the charity, so many people have attended our retreats and found it life changing. And interestingly, Louis, it's the charity is run by myself and Jimmy, our daughter Rosa, who produces the food. She's also a young producer in London and our son, who's a physical trainer. And it's 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 amazing because in many ways it's their way of holding Josh close. They miss their brother and a sibling's grief is a very complex thing, often rather silent not understood so for them it's their way of giving back and um, by being involved in the charities retreats which we run twice a year they've been able to process their grief manage their grief and help support other people but then it dawned on us that we needed to capture the essence of what we do and I guess a book writing a book was the only way that we were going to be able to do that and it, it was something that it's been really hard. I mean, two years in the writing, um, but the relief when it was finally published in the UK in October, gone, um, was enormous. And, and, and the book, When Words Are Not Enough, that you mentioned earlier, is a kind of, it's a kind of um, contribution from 13 bereaved people who all talk about their loved ones. And it's framed around mine and Jimmy's experience of grief and loss. But the 13 individuals who've taken part all talk about how they have survived their grief through being creative and active, whether that be swimming, whether it be painting, whether it be photography. They found that intentionally embracing their grief has been a way of moving forward again. And it's been inspirational for us. People have trusted us with their stories and we've included 13 stories in the book. Um, as well as some theory Great. about attachment and grief and, 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 and what it means. We've tried to simplify that theory down so it's accessible to everyone. I'm going to ask you if you'd hold the book up again for a second. I was going to say sure. I'm unprofessional. I'm always unprofessional. Let me just get it to focus. Oh, Seriously. Okay. There we go. Okay, thanks. I was going to say, I'm always unprofessional. I'm never a professional. I just wanted to give a, a snap of that. Yeah. Uh, writing, again, there's so many places I want to go. I showed you how many pages I had turned down, plus my notes. Yes. notes. But when you, the foreword from, again, our friend, Dr. Catherine Mannix, about meeting you, about how she had met you, the showing of the film, A Love That Never uh, Dies, with... Um, Mm -hmm. Catherine, if you don't mind a, a minute about the relationship now with Dr. Catherine Mannix. So Dr. Dr. Catherine Mannix has written two remarkable books. One's called Listen and another one's called With the End in Mind. And her speciality is encouraging people to approach death without fear and to understand it in an accessible way. And we knew of her work because she's a best-selling author. And when we asked her if she would come and see our film, A Love That Never Dies, she was kind of, she told us later she was reticent. She was worried because she thought very, very humbly as she's such a modest person, how can I help them? I can't help. I don't, I don't have any answers, but of course she does because she knows that listening without fear and being alongside is the best thing that you can do for bereaved people. The thing about grief is that there's so much discomfort around it and people don't know how to manage their fear. And as I said to Catherine, as Catherine fed back to us, just knowing that being there was enough, just listening was enough, that there's no reason to come up with answers. I can read a little bit from her introduction if you'd like. I would love that. Yeah. When words, Catherine writes, um, this book is about sorrow, yet it is brimming with hope. This book is about loss, but it overflows with love and generosity. The community of bereaved parents is as diverse as humanity itself. And this book is a gathering of their wisdom guided and curated by the creative talents and parental grief of Jane Harris and Jimmy Edmonds. She goes on to say, 
that she first met us at a showing of, of our film, A Love That Never Dies. And she says that basically, and it's so flattering, but she says that the book offers us all an insight into the power of creativity to shine a light into the dark abyss of grief. It captures the possibility of creating new ways of relating to those whose deaths we mourn and whose presence we yearn for. It provides practical and helpful insights from grief theory to mindfulness that can enable us all to process our own grief and to become wiser, kinder companions to others who are grieving. This is a book to savor and treasure. Well, I mean, how beautiful, how generous is that? Um, well, it's accurate. I, from me saying it, Jane Harris, I, having read the book, uh, I, I find it a hundred percent accurate. You know, I couldn't have said it. I couldn't have come up with those those beautiful words if she did. Yet, in reading that in the introduction, it's like, yes, that's absolutely what it is. That's absolutely what it is. And what you've done for people uh, literally around the world, what you and Jimmy have done, and Good Grief Project uh, .co .uk, we've got those links up, around literally around the world, the people that you've heard from and the people that you'll never hear from that you've impacted. I know when, when I've talked about your work, when you've been on with me and when I've talked solo about it, the response that I get from people that, you know, have gone to the website, books, whatever, uh, the impact that it makes, because it's one of those things that, and I, I've certainly have had loss, not, not like your loss yet. Like you said, uh, earlier a, a death um in the wrong order of things yes and yes. when you think about how how it is for people and how people process it and or push try to push it away and the way i see it, the more you try to push it away a line i've used for other things and i'm thinking might be if you don't mind you deal with it whatever it is a, a you know or it will deal with you. It's not something you you can't, it's in you. It's not something you can push away. It percolates yes. if you don't, even if you do. But I think that's absolutely true. Sorry, I'm rambling. That's, that's absolutely true, that if you don't express it, it will find a way out. And the problem with that is that, yes. um, you know, it can cause panic, anxiety, physical, mental health issues. So it's about encouraging people to find an expression for their grief, a language for their grief. And it's really important that people take on that as a responsibility to be able to listen without running away, without fear, without panic, just be there and listen and keep breathing. And that's how you can best support. I mean, as a therapist, people always say to me, how can I help someone who's grieving? And I would say, the first thing you need to do is manage yourself. You need to recognize that you can't make it better. Yeah. And as soon as you stop trying to make it better, that person will feel contained. And I think that every contributor to our book, all 13 contributors, talk about the need to express themselves, the need to be heard, the need to say their child or their partner or their loved one's name, um, and how helpful that is. And that means the world to them. So they've all shared their stories within the book, um, you know, from from painters to a, a young musician whose dad died very suddenly um, from um, pancreatic cancer. You know, within two months of diagnosis, he was dead. And she didn't she couldn't believe that her love couldn't save him. And she writes about that in the book. How can it be? that this could happen to her dad. They were so close, you know, she's, she was one of, by coincidence, one of Josh's best friends when, you know, when they were growing up and her dad was one of our closest friends and to lose him so suddenly, it felt like a real honor that she trusted us to share her story. She's a musician who's really worth listening to. I don't know how well known, she, she might not even be known in the States, but her music is, so accessible. Her name is Carmody. Um, and th this is Carmody. Carmody, she, com she comes up on Spotify. She's amazing. Her words, her lyrics are all about 
her most recent lyrics are all about what it's like to lose her dad. And in the chapter in the book, she she talks about a song that she wrote dedicated to her dad called This is Jupiter. Um, and it's just, the chapter is called Stronger Than My Love. And she talks about that feeling of helplessness that there's nothing she could do to stop him dying and that she was going to have to find a way of using her art, which is singing music as a musician, to find her way through. Um, and the songs she's written, inspired by her father's death, are just breathtaking and really worth listening to. Yeah. Really I'm worth listening to. You mentioned that because her chat, all the chapters are, are just are so powerful and so... It's just you've got to get the book, folks. I, I just know when words are not enough. I the words aren't enough for me to praise this book and the importance of it, and the importance of it. And I I've said this many times. I was talking about it earlier this morning. Jane Harris said, "You may not be grieving now, but you will be at some point. At some point, my thoughts are." Not that it's not that any, I, I hate to use the word easier, mm. but knowing, but having some tools or having some understanding prior to, you know, we have the, the library has these grief 101. I always tell people, don't wait, go, go and learn, go in and learn now. Get well, it helps so fine. much because it normalizes what you're going through. I mean, I've just started to read a book called The Grieving Brain, which has come out in the States recently, and it's fantastic. And she writes, Mary Frances O'Connor writes about grief and grieving. Um, and the thing is that grief and grieving are different. Grief is something that you are feeling. But you carry on grieving, don't you? You carry on grieving. I mean, I can grieve for Josh 11 years on. So something might, you know, it might be his birthday. It might be his death day. I'm fine a lot of the time. That I've learned how to carry the loss of my son in my heart comfortably. The, the edges are not jagged anymore. I can, I have internalized that kind of experience. I've, I've, but it's been hard work. And I think the thing about grief is that your brain has a lot to manage the shock and the trauma, and you can't not be traumatized when you've experienced an untimely death. So we need to say to people, don't panic, you're not going crazy. This is normal, you will feel foggy, you will feel confused, you will feel full of doubt, you'll lose your confidence, you'll lose your identity it's okay be around people who can just be alongside you and find your new normal because the world will never be the same again but that doesn't mean to say the world can't be a good enough place as you rediscover meaning again i'm talking with jane harris the new book available in the states by the way it was released the end of last year in the uk when words are not enough creative responses to grief and go to griefproject.co.uk we've got lots of links up at louisfreeshow.com louisbefree.com wfmj just go to go to your your website and you can get you'll you'll find all the information one of the things that uh, i hear and I wish I didn't when people say, will say things like bring closure to, there's no closure to the loss of a loved one. There's no, I'll do air quotes. No one's going to say, what does that even mean? Yes, it's such a good point, Louise. So that this book, When Words Are Not Enough, is all about the fact that for us, closure is the dirty C word. Closure is not what we are about. We're about openings. And every one of our contributors to the book has discovered, as do the people on our retreats, that what they're actually discovering is that it's about openings. It's about new learning. It's a bit like, I mean, it is mad to think that, you know, when your kid goes away traveling for a couple of years, if you have kids, do you stop loving them while they're not there? Well, of course not. You love them even more. When your child or your loved one dies, 
you don't stop loving them. You carry on loving them and your love can even become stronger, but it never goes away. And people, a lot of people think that closure is what happens to people after after they've been bereaved you know they'll get over it have you found your are you your old self again have you found closure and i always gently say and i'm a therapist so i'm able to do this gently a lot of people aren't so gentle in their response how could you find closure when your child has died there is no such thing and we hope that the book when words are not enough models a kind of idea that it's okay to carry on loving your person that that's not dysfunctional. Let's not pathologize grief. Let's give per people permission to grieve in whatever way feels comfortable to them. Because let's face it, everybody grieves completely differently depending on their background, their attachment model. As a therapist, myself, it's interesting actually, because myself and Catherine Mannix, we, Jimmy and myself were invited to the Freud Museum in London to talk about our book. Now, Sigmund Freud lost a child. His beloved daughter died and it was life changing for him. He realized that a lot of his thinking about children and death were needing to be adapted. And it was such an honor to be asked to go to the Freud Museum and do an interview there about our book. And the person I thought that I'd like to be interviewed by was Catherine Mannix. So I invited Catherine to come to the Freud Museum and to interview me about our book. And she came along and that's now available on demand via the Freud Museum. But what was so interesting was talking about the unconscious nature of the fear that surrounds grief because people are so terrified of the subject and what better place to talk about the unconscious than the Freud Museum. <laughs> And Catherine, Catherine and myself had a really interesting conversation about trying to help people to overcome the fear around end of life, right. around yeah. fear of illness, around fear of diagnosis, that we all need to be able to get alongside people and recognize that most people are grieving for something, certainly post COVID. It really is tough. Most people are grieving for something. Not everyone has had the trauma of of the death of a child i'm not saying that but it's not great to get hung up on a kind of hierarchy of grief i think it's about listening to everyone as an individual about respecting everyone's story and we hope that when words are not enough does that that everyone can tell their story we've we have focused of course on untimely dread on untimely death in the book where where death has come through illness or, you know, through accident, accident or trauma. But the point is, is that every person has found some way of moving forward after the, the loss of their loved one by being able to be intentionally active in their approach to what it is they're feeling in their body and their mind. It's interesting you say that because of the different, you know, people will, they compare everything yours is worth and yet they're diff, different and i am i understand that it reminds me when i decades ago pre-radio days when i first started talking about it on a panel about being sexually abused uh, with people and uh, people would come up to me after and say yours was so much worse than mine i mm -hmm. said my, and my response was even back then when i was much younger i said not for you you, know, mm. you don't compare. You don't compare. That I don't find that healthy for anyone. Mm. I mean, if someone says, "Well, yours," you know, I lost my dad to leukemia X amount of years ago. Yours was worse than mine. Yes, it was like you say, uh, death in the wrong order. Certainly, certainly. If I step back a little, it is at the time. Grief is grief. Yes, grief don't is compare. Grief. And, and it's not comforting to anybody, correct? No, that's right. We hope that, we do hope that our book gives people permission to do what feels right for them and that rules don't really help. That, you know, this idea of everyone grieves in their own individual way is absolutely true. And that for some people, therapy helps. For other people, peer support helps. For other people, picking up a book helps. For other people, listening to a podcast. You know, we all do it in our own way. And... 
we don't want to be prescriptive and we don't want to pathologize and we don't want people to feel that they're failing and a lot of my clients in therapy will say it's been a month and, and people are telling me that i'm not over it and what's the matter with me or it's been two months and i why aren't you your old self and i say well you know that's about them it's not about not. you you're in the early stages you, you know you have to be able to do it your way and it's really saddening that people are so caught up in getting it right for other people when with grief you have to do what's right for you as an individual and that does depend on your background your history your own previous traumas in your life grief is 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 a is a very complex thing and jane Harris, i understand the the you know it's been x amount of weeks or months what's wrong with me and i shared this with you i believe before with my dad this was 30 plus years ago uh that when he died i remember a couple of weeks maybe a month after i'm driving home from work and i'm tearing up and i'm thinking i thought what's wrong with me it's been almost a month already and then i i thought about it and thought you know for better or worse that you know Mm. difficult relationship most m many times good but with my dad tumultuous i think is how i say it uh for 39 years he, he was in my life and i'm thinking a month later and now we're think never you're never going to be i'll do the air quotes over it what yes. you know but that was my thinking at the time that there was something wrong with me that I was still impacted. So I understand when your clients come to you yes. and, and say that. And yeah, I'm, you're right. there to set but them straight though. <laughs> and it's, but it's triggers, isn't it? You know, in fact, a dear friend of mine wrote to me today and she said, Jane, I was thinking of you. You were there when my daughter was born 35 years ago and your Joshua was born two months later. And she said, I wish Joshua was here. Um, and so yeah. What she was saying was it was her daughter's 35th birthday. Joshua would have been 35. And I felt myself tearing up in that moment. I felt a desperate loss and sadness as well as a happiness that her daughter was 35 and alive. But the reality is Josh isn't here. What would he have been doing now? How would he be in the world? What would he have? What path would he have taken? And 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 that's the reality of it. I'm in a good place. But the point is grief can be triggered and it will be triggered and it's not it's feel the fear and kind of live it in a way i'm talking with jane harris uh, when words are not enough creative responses to grief and the book we've got links up you can get it in the states now uh, which is great which is absolutely great i i can't more highly recommend this book and the importance of it for someone that you know who's experienced grief regardless of how recent, but for, I, I got to say again, Jane Harris, for everyone, because we're all going to experience grief at some point. And to have some of this knowledge, if you will, and some of this presented prior to, I think is, is of utmost importance for people. Yes. It's, 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 we were so honored. I mean, in the States, we, 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 when we were making our film, as we were traveling across America, a love that never dies, we met somebody called Professor Robert Neumeyer, who's really well known in the States. And he has supported our work. And he's the director of the Portland Institute for Loss and Transition in the States, and has written lots and lots of books about continuing bonds. And he's done a review of the book. And, and, and what he says is just so honoring in a way as well. He says, that when words are not enough offers that rarest of bereavement resources, a visual and verbal feast and a sustained look into the heart of grief that both acknowledges the raw anguish of tragic loss and invites the reader to share a fascinating and diverse gathering of responses to it. And what he's saying is, I think that, you know, there's hope and meaning in the book. And for us, that, that, that fills us with a, a level of relief because to write a hopeful and positive book about grief is really hard but i think that the point about our book is people tell us it's a visual book and that they haven't come across a visual book about grief and so that was we wanted to create a book that you could just pick up and put down 
at any page. You don't need to read it from front to back. You can open it. I mean, I don't know, Louis, if you open it now and it opens at a page, I hope that you can just kind of, you know, take it from there. And I think when you're grieving, the thing about grief brain is it's really hard to concentrate. So we wanted to create a book that was visual, that you could pick up and put down. You don't have to read from beginning to end. Because that's what it's like for grievers. When you, Jane, one of the things I want to make sure I touch on, just briefly about a couple of emails we get about, uh, uh, we we talked earlier about closure and Mm. things that people say to others. And I've always said, I know people are well-intended when they say uh, time heals all wounds or time makes it better or, or, or I know how you feel. Uh, I know people are well-intended, so I don't want to sound overly critical, but we need to think about what we say to people and be there. I know one of the things Dr. Catherine Mannix said years ago when we were talking about death, she said, just take a pie. She, I remember her saying, just take a pie. If you just drop off a pie, just, you know, j- just being there for someone the, the best that you can. And don't say that time, I'm saying, don't say time makes it better. Time may make it different. Your reaction to, like you were saying, things that trigger things, times. Yes. Time doesn't make the loss of a loved one better. It makes it different. And I think that, you know, being prescriptive doesn't help. It's it's much better to recognize that everyone's grief is very personal. And I think that every person who contributed to, to our book from Carmody, the musician, to um, Jim Claiborne, who, who went in, who found that nature helped him carving wood in the forest, taught him about life and death and helped him accept the death of his beautiful daughter. Um, you know, there's Gary who did a doodle a day. He decided that drawing, doing a drawing for his kids every day would help him through. Jimmy got into wild water swimming, cold water swimming, along with a few other people where they felt, I mean, Jimmy felt that he was connected with Josh when he swam in nature. He could feel Josh's presence in a very comforting way. And he, uh, there's a little line in the book, actually, a very short line, Louis. Shall I just read it to you oh, from Jimmy? Oh, please do. You, you saw, I showed you before how many pages I, I <laughs> you read that I read. Please well, do. Jimmy writes, because Jimmy, you know, when Josh died, I think both Jimmy and myself thought we, no parent can survive the death of a child. Well, we, well, you can, and it's hard. But I remember Jimmy writing these words when we were pulling the book together, and he says, I can safely say that without my swimming, I don't think I would be grieving so well, though putting into words just how is not going to be easy. As a journey, it's so much about feelings and a visceral experience that takes you to a place where words and metaphors are rendered redundant. My first dip into the cold, my first intentional dip, one with Josh very much on my mind, was in forbidden waters. There are signs all around a lake where we used to live, declaring no swimming. But it was here that Josh used to come with his friends on a sunny summer afternoon. And it was here that I found the comfort in his presence. And that, and I'm, I'm skipping forward. Jimmy goes on to say, again, I did not know, but my introduction to nature's very own watery pleasures was accompanied with a renewed sense of getting to know Josh in a way that began to put a bit more substance into my relationship with him, to begin to fill the void left by his absence. And that void, I think, is at the heart of what bereaved people feel. There's an empty space. And what you do with the empty space, I guess, is at the heart of this book, that empty space, that void. It, it, it's the sort of thing people in early grief find really annoying to say you can move forward. Yes, you can, but not everyone knows how to do it. You have to be patient and you have to look for ways to fill the void. And you'll learn so much with the book, the new book by Jane Harris and her husband, Jimmy Edmonds, when words are not enough, creative responses to grief. One of the things, I've got to talk about the blue boxes, the boxes in the book, which are, tell us about them. So we decided that it would be really useful to be able to reduce grief theory, well, in fact, psychological theory, right down so that anyone could dip in and kind of simplify stuff um, around theory around grief. We don't, 
you know, there's some fantastic theories out there, but they're not altogether helpful. Like the stages of grief are something that we would challenge. The stages of grief tends to get rolled out all the time with a bit of a drum roll. There are stages, but we would say those stages come in different order at different times. Don't get hooked on what yeah. you feel you're supposed Age to do. Right. Everyone does it differently. We don't like this idea that there is a correct way to grieve. So the grief, the, the boxes in the book are basically simplified theory, looking at attachment, looking at stages of grief, looking at what is grief. And we've tried to make it as accessible and digestible as possible without oversimplifying. And that includes different models of grief theory. Um, but we really have tried to make it, as I say, as digestible as possible. So you can just pick up the book and put it down, go away, come back to it. I'm, I'm here to say, as a, I will say, obsessive reader, I was used to say voracious reader, uh, mm -hmm. that it, it is absolutely that. It was absolutely, when we communicated and I knew the book was coming out, receiving the book and opening it, because a lot of books, understandably, depending on what it is, need to go in a certain order. You know, not to be like a cookbook. If you're baking something, you, you can't, you, you've got to go in certain orders. And other books, you've got to go so that you you have a foundation for this, and then you go on to the next chapter, you learn something there, et cetera, et cetera. With your book, with your new book, When Words Are Not Enough, Creative Responses to Grief, Jane Harris, it is exactly that. You can pick it up, which is great because especially for such a, a challenging topic, people aren't going to... Now, again, someone that wants to be there for someone and wants to learn, I think... It doesn't have to be cover to cover, but you're gonna you you want to read as much of it as as possible. Yet for someone in the grief or someone close to someone in the grief, you pick it up and you read it. And again, those the what you call the blue boxes are incredibly powerful. And yeah, that's great to hear. I'm sorry. Thank I'm, you, Louis. No, that's great Thank to you. hear that it works like that because you know, I mean, we you know the book. As you said, it's available now in the States and it's available by Amazon and it's available by the independent publishing group. I think it's called IPG. But what we need to make it available to people is reviews and feedback. Um, and, you know, we went with a small independent publisher because we wanted to support this publisher and they were so encouraging of us and we, but we need help to get the book out there. And we would so value feedback from people because every all, our, all the proceeds from the book go back into our charity which then funds people to attend our grief retreats so it's a not-for-profit it is a charity that we run um and everything that comes out of the book everything that comes out of the charity goes straight back in to fund bereaved parents to attend our retreats so that it's beautiful. available to anyone and everyone regardless of income and that's beautiful about you and jimmy because you don't want you wouldn't want economics to deter someone or make it inaccessible exactly yeah. it's about equity it's about access equal access. access and you know what i guess what we need is a little bit of help to get it out there for people to read it review it let us know and you have just been so positive and encouraging about our book we're really grateful louis for all your grateful for what you do great words thank you thank you, so much, thank you. because it's accurate my words are, are honest and, and accurate about the book when words are not enough creative responses to grief like you say i mean you can pick it up anywhere any chapter one of the ones i wanted to mention a doodle a day and i'm glad because i had so many pages turned down yes, <laughs> yes. Was, but I found that, that the Gary Andrews piece about the, the doodle a day. Yes. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. So Why, well. <laughs> Gary on. Andrews, I mean, it, it's a fabulous thing, isn't it? So when, when his wife Joy died in 2017, um, he decided to use his way of drawing and doodling as a sort of creative way of managing his grief. And he's known on social media as Gary Scribbler. And he does a doodle every day. He's a professional illustrator and animator with a career stretching right back through, um, you know, Farm and Sam, the world of Peter Rabbit. We're going on a bear hunt. Um, and, and he's still doing it. I mean, he we're delighted that he took part in our book. Um, and I think he's modeled to his children that 
he's been able to survive the death of their mother, you know, by doing this very creative act of unpacking his feelings through a daily drawing, um, which helped, he says, which helped him to let go of some of the pain, getting it down on paper, exercising those demons that can grow and gnaw away in the darkness. Um, and he's found it so therapeutic to draw. And again, putting it out there, putting it. And putting it out, out there. Yourself, I mean, his book is called. Yeah, he's got a beautiful book called Finding Joy, um, by Gary Andrews, which is available through Hodder and Stoughton. Stoughton. Um, but yeah, you know, there's just so many amazing, inspirational people out there doing wonderful things, and the people in our book are not all successful artists. Far from it. Right. Yes. They're just right. ordinary people doing ordinary things. Actually, they're ordinary people doing extraordinary things, to be honest. But let's not get the word creative too. Let's not put it too much on a pedestal. We're talking about, you know, one of our contributors would take her daughter's T-shirts and sew them together into a kind of form that was comforting. Anyone can do something. You don't have to be an artist. We're not we're not promoting this idea of creative yeah. geniuses everyone has that within them if they're given the right space and i know that on our grief retreats the um when people arrive on our weekend grief retreats they always say i shouldn't be here this is a mistake it's not going to work it's a disaster and by the end of the weekend their shoulders have dropped their faces have got some color they've managed to i think share something of themselves in a safe environment where they feel hopeful again and that's it. Anyone can, with the right support, find some way through. Someone uh, emailed me about how they always wanted the garden and yet never did. Uh -huh. so I, I, it's a, a lengthy email, and I'm, I'm grateful for the email, which I, I will read in its entirety as soon as uh, later this afternoon. Yet started to plant flowers and vegetables, you know, created a garden that has been so important yes. for her dealing with uh, managing, I guess I yeah. should, she said dealing, but de yeah, dealing with the grief. Dealing with it. Nature is amazing. What a teacher. Yeah. Yeah. What a teacher. And, you know, as the wood turner in our book talks about, you know, just not knowing how to survive the death of his daughter. And that somehow by by being in nature, in the woods, carving wood, it wow. gave him that sense of purpose and identity. Um, I mean, he he does write beautiful, beautiful yeah. words about his. I started learn I started learning green woodworking a few months after Phoebe died. This is his daughter who died at a very young age. And I recognized that I needed to keep my hands and mind busy. My mantra was do something. Nature is full of life and death, breathing through COVID in a time where we could touch nothing. I find myself in this place of living, of living things that needed to be touched. It felt like a comfortable place to be. The woodland offered me a reprieve from the chore of grief, but it also allowed me to face my grief in a gentler environment. So being in nature, being in the woods, yeah. he felt safe. He and could learn from awesome. nature. And isn't that lovely? I mean, we can all do that if we want to. When you say say that about different things, it just reminded me about uh, when after my dad died, after they put the headstone in uh, the grave mark, whatever. Someone had suggested a friend of mine was an artist. She had suggested that I do a I can't think of what it's called, where you put a piece of paper up and you take a color of whatever and you yes. make a, there's a, a word for it. I can't yeah. I can't think of what it is, mm -hmm. and I I'm just remembering now you know, 30 plus years ago, Jane Harris, about how that, that felt doing that. And yeah, it was tearful. Yeah. At the time, but it was, it was important to do for me at the time. I, get that, Lou. Yeah. I think that at the heart of our work and our book, it's, it's about capturing memories, capturing moments. Photography is at the heart of everything we do. An image can lead you to this idea of a continuing bond you know you can create something new out of something that's gone before people bring their photographs on on the retreat um and they don't want to share them at the beginning but by the end they've created a new photograph we run a workshop jimmy runs a workshop where he teaches people he he encourages people to create a new image out of the old image using props 
using whatever they like, using the environment. And people leave with a new image. And this idea of continuing bonds, it's like a sort of miracle, but it's not. It's accessible to everyone. But photography is such an important part of that work. And, yes. and it's at the heart of what we do. Um, and Jimmy's, you know, I suppose he has survived his grief. The death of his son, he's found new meaning, new hope, new creativity. And this book is full of his photographs. It really is, as you know, that I mean, the photography is quite staggering. It's beautiful. The, the photography is beautiful. Also, you know, when Jimmy, this one chapter about uh, building the casket, our first creative act, yes. and how powerful uh, that is. I do want to say about nature, one of the things I've learned over the years is, and I used to call it on my way home, my head clearing hike, because I go to the, there's a beautiful park uh, in the very close, you don't have to drive to it right off a of main road in a few minutes. One of the things I, I've realized over the years is, yeah, if I go to a gym or if I run around the neighborhoods or whatever, yeah, I'm getting good, good, um, good exercise and it's good for me. The difference I realized after a while, Jane Harris, is when I do it in the park, my head feels better. I, mm. you know, not only do I feel good because I exercise my, and I know it's good for me, but there's something about being in nature it's yes. different. It's different. I mean, absolutely. And at the heart of our work is this idea of active grief, being physically active. And I know that in the early stages of my grief, when I felt I couldn't get out of bed or I couldn't function, that's when I most had to get up and go out for a run, a slow run. You know, when you need it most, you want to do it least. And in yes. a way, you, yes. you have to keep going. And I think that's probably one of the most important things to keep going. You have to try and find a purpose. And being physical and active, if you can, it really helps clear the head, regardless of where you're yeah, at. Regardless of where you're at. I think it's better in nature, but that's me. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree, definitely. Go to the whatever, wherever. Jane Harris, the tipping point for you to get out of bed? The tipping what do you point think that was for you to say, okay, I don't want to get out and exercise. I don't want to go on a run. Mm. I need to, I have to. Yes, it, 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 I suppose in the early stages of grief, the recognition was that if I didn't, I would drown in my grief. That in a way I could, I didn't want to turn away from the world. But I think when you're in deep trauma and deep loss, the, the instinct is just to close down. And everyone has to do it their way. But for me, I knew that if I, if I looked in, if I turned away, if I closed down, I wouldn't find my way through it. And I think Jimmy was the same, you know, and that's the model of the Good Grief Project doing whatever it is you can do, but somehow getting the right support, whether it's peer support, whether it's photography, whether it's food, you know, there's so many different ways of approaching this. And that's the beauty of the book, when words are not enough, creative responses to grief, creative, and emphasizing the word creative, because it is, it's creative responses to grief. And you yeah. may read the book and find something that inspires you or that you want to do, um, there may be something that inspires you if if you're not grieving to start doing. Yes. And when you are grieving, which we all are going to be grieving at, at some point, that you you it even accentuates. You're even you've you've got a place to go. If you haven't, you get ideas and come up with your or or and or come up with your own idea from the inspirations in the book, when words are not enough, creative responses to grief. And of course, we've got the links up. Just a little bit more about the Good Grief Project, the Good Grief Project, uh, org.uk, project.uk. Yeah. Um, so did you, did you want me to say something more about that? Just a little bit, a little bit more. Uh, yeah, so we started charity, charity um, as a way of encouraging people to be active and creative. We, we found that by running these retreats, these weekend retreats, um, and by trying to create a more comfortable language around the subject of grief, it's really um, help people, it's helped normalize this abnormal, if you like, situation. And it's, it's gone from strength to strength. And I think that by writing the book, we've kind of captured the last 10 years, the book is, if you like, 
encapsulating 10 years of development since, since Josh's death in 2011 to now. It's all about the retreats, it's all about creativity, it's all about being active, it's all about photography. It's all about finding what you need. And it's also about encouraging people. The charity is all about encouraging people to do the work too. It's not for the bereaved to sort it. It's for the bereaved friends and family yes. to step up Absolutely. and get more comfortable um, so that they can just be there without fixing it. I, I, I get I'm asked all the time it. by people who say they feel so helpless, they don't know what to do, they feel they're not being a good friend because they can't fix it. And all you have to say is, you are being the best friend in the world. If you can just be alongside without giving advice, without coming out with cliches, without being drowned in your own discomfort, that's what grievers need. And if you need support with that, look the other way, get support, away from the bereaved person and then come back and carry on supporting them. Don't look to the bereaved person to make it okay for you. you. It's not about you. It's not about, it's you. about the bereaved person. And that's the best advice I can give anyone. It's get strong, get, yes. get, get yes. sort of able and uh, find ways and strategies of managing your discomfort when you're with bereaved people. And that's the best possible solution to break the isolation that is the experience that most so many bereaved people talk about and and beautiful and important advice i also would suggest that you gift the book if you know someone that is even if they're not grieving but if you know someone that is grieving what a beautiful gift again nothing you're going to say no as you said cliches but gifting this book to someone would i'm gonna get emotional i'm sorry would be such a beautiful act such That's so beautiful. nice of you to say that, Louis. We had a funeral director recently say to us that he wanted to give our book to every person who he organized a funeral for. Oh, that's perfect. That's Isn't that just beautiful? He wanted to give them a book as part of running a funeral for them, creating a celebration of life. And I think that's, I mean, what a lovely thing to do, to, to recognize that the book is not going to, make it worse it's, it is what it is and it's that's, hope. that's a perfect perfect idea for for all and i think all funeral directors should consider mm -hmm. that i think libraries should could base a uh, group do. on on your book when words are not enough creative responses to grief and also grief groups or or whatever whatever the you know different groups that get together or parkinson's cancer uh, uh, whatever, whatever the group is, whatever. Parkinson's cancer, yeah. dementia, everything where people are grieving for something. It's about loss in all its forms, whether it's loss of health, whether it's loss of relationship, whether it's loss of identity. Think of refugees. You know, we go into at the Good Grief Project. One of the ways we raise money as well is to go into big companies and give talks, lunchtime talks to people for a very large fee. And that goes straight back into the charity. Sure. And we talk to them about embracing change in the workplace and how they can, how organizations can support their staff when their staff have maybe gone through a, a death, a diagnosis, an illness. Um, and so we talk, myself and Lizzie Pinker, Pickering, who's a colleague and, and supporter of the Good Grief Project, we give these lunchtime talks to people. And the feedback's amazing because people say, wow, it's okay to talk about this. Um, we must we must encourage our colleagues and staff members to we must give them a more comfortable place in the workplace. That's, I, I love that. That's uh, again beautiful. All kinds of creativity, all kinds of, of beautiful ideas, and you do such a. You and Jimmy have started an organization that is such a light to the world. And I, as I said before, you, you'll never have any idea of all the lives you touch. Certainly you get amazing feedback. I see it. I see it online. I see it on your social media, uh, some of the reviews. Yet you, you never you never know all the lives that you touch. Thank you, Louis. And it's been such an honor to talk to you. And thank oh. you for your compassion and consideration in, in, in giving space to this very difficult subject, which an awful lot of people step away from. So thank you. Thank you for who you are in, in the world. And um, again, the book, When Words Are Not Enough, 
Creative Responses to Grief, Jane Harris and Jimmy Edmonds' new book, and available, yay, in the States. <laughs> so we don't, you don't have to wait for it too long for the UK. Yeah, it's available in the States, and it's also now available in Australia, I believe, um, oh, and in wonderful. the UK um, via our publisher, via With any the... book should be able to get it, I believe. But yeah, that independent, uh, yeah. Yeah. So if you want to get it locally, if you have an independent bookseller, again, encourage them to get it and to stock the book. They can That's order right. one certainly for you. I know a lot of people like to patronize local booksellers, even some of the chains, because they're, you know, they're in the community and they're providing the, the bookstore there and they're hiring local. And I, I'm all for that. I'm 100% yeah, for that. We find a lot of independent bookshops here want to stock it and keep it, but it's also okay. available by all the big um networks and organizations yeah. too and if anyone reads it and they want to review it that really does help us get it out to more people that seems to be the way the algorithm works it's a whole new world out there was publishing so um, like we're not publishing amazon review it anywhere yeah, else. yeah absolutely i mean in the uk it's had a lot of five star reviews which means that it gets seen by many more people in the u in the, the US, it hasn't okay, been reviewed much um and therefore you know it really helps us so if anyone reads it it really helps to review it um and you know libraries can stock it it's available through the independent ipg independent publishing group i think just by googling it it should come up it should be available through all good bookstores well all bookstores in all principle bookstores. Well, i'd all, love to all, hear all, if all, it all. is and if not i'm very happy to answer people's questions if people want to find out more just to get in touch um via info at the good grief project.co.uk and the website for the good grief project as you know is www.thegoodgriefproject.co.uk and we have a facebook twitter and instagram page um, so we're we're all available, but the thing is, there are a few good grief projects now. So just to be careful, you get the right one. This is the good grief project, and again, <laughs> the website is the good grief project co uk. That's it. for people who say dot co. That's the, the dot co uk. And if anyone wants to write to us, or if anyone wants more information, or if people want us to talk to their organisations, we will do that, and that all goes to supporting our charity and helping other people to attend our retreats fully funded. Absolutely. So it's all very circular. But yeah. thank you, Louis. I'm so I'm so delighted I'm so to talk honored. to you again. Always. And to be able to share our book and for you to be, I suppose, the first person we've really spoken to in the States about our book. Yay. 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 So but thank not you. the last. Not the last. <laughs> certainly not certainly not the last. I'm honored. I'm honored. I'm honored to know you. you. And your work is just so vitally important for everyone. For everyone. Thank you, Louis. You're amazing. Say hi to Jimmy for me. I will. And thank you so much. And I'll we'll drop you an hopefully. email after this as well. Hopefully we can do it again in the, yeah, the lovely. future. Thanks, Jane. Thank Thanks, you. Take Jane. good care of self. I will. I will. Likewise. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, that Jane Harris, and again, 